Hey guys, welcome back to the Joe Silverback Show. I'm your host, Joe Bunton. And today we're gonna to be talking about individual responsibility versus others taking care of us. Um, let me preface this by stating that the sooner a child can take full 100% responsibility for his or her life, the better that child has of becoming a responsible adult. I'm gonna say it again, the sooner a child can take 100% responsibility for his or her life, the better chances of that child becoming a responsible, whole and complete adult. So notwithstanding child labor laws and notwithstanding all kinds of um, psycho babble and mamsy pamsy baby stuff, uh, the pendulum has swung so far in the direction of parents by fiat becoming the obligators to take care of their children in perpetuity as, as, as if there's some written contract that, child, that, that children have to be provided for um, forever. And let's just, let's just break that down for a minute because that, that ties into a generational thing that's going on where generations are growing up not only thinking that their parents should take care of them, but, but that society should take care of them and their government should take care of them. And that's not the way that I was raised and that's not the way my parents were raised. Um, and so it's a generational thing that's taken place. First and foremost, when I was... Uh, coming of age, meaning that at that time, 18 years old, uh, my dad was destitute. My mom was working, providing for a family of five and they were divorced and we wouldn't have dreamed of expecting anything from our mother um, beyond what she had already done, even though we did expect stuff from her and even though she did provide beyond that, God bless her. Um, but there was there was this hammer that was, you know, pounded onto our, our consciousness about taking responsibility. There was this hammer about um, not, not buying beyond your means so that my sisters were trained by my mother by going to garage sales and learning how to buy cheap things or hand-me-downs or secondhand things or used things that you could get for pennies on the dollar um, that cost a lot of money. And if you didn't have the money, well, you couldn't afford something. And secondly, uh, my mother raised five children. And even if she raised one child or two children, the, the, the obligation for her to raise my children or, or any of my siblings' children, you know, is just out of the question. And it doesn't mean that we weren't a family where there was an extended hand. My mother took in grandchildren and my mother helped out her children when they were single parents working full time and their children needed to be dropped off, um, all kinds of things. But my mother also taught us, made us, forced us, pushed us, hammered us to have our own spine, have our own backbone work that was the first thing work work if you wanted to exist in this world you had to work so today you've got generations who actually don't think they have to work that's a number that's a big problem two you have generations who think if your parents can afford it well why shouldn't they continue to take care of you and provide things for you provide things like a car and an insurance and oh if you damage the car well then they'll give you another one oh you know if you you know flaked off at your job and, and and you need to come back home well sure come on back home well at what point you know does that end and in today's uh you know, generational um, problems with wanting to be taken care of, it just doesn't ever end. Similarly, we've got this conflict going on in this, in this culture where the, 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 the John Kennedy asks not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country has been turned upside down on its head. 
So we now have any group who's disgruntled, any group who's disgruntled, anybody who wants to make a claim against the government for doing anything wrong automatically expects that the government should just bend over and let them stand and walk all over their backs and feed them and hand it over to them. Well, I didn't get anything from the government. My father didn't get anything from the government. My mother didn't get anything from the government. They were dirt, dirt poor. We were poor. And we had to work to provide food. We had to work to provide a domicile, shelter. And that's basic, but the opportunity to work, the opportunity to provide a domicile, the opportunity to provide food is there for anybody who wants to take it. And it's the only way that you can step outside of victimhood. Victimhood means I've had a, a rough go at life. I've had some bad breaks. Hand me something for free. Sorry, that doesn't make you feel better. It makes you actually feel worse. What makes you feel better is getting up off your sorry rear, getting up off your keister, and doing anything. And today with technology, you don't even have to get up off your keister. Now I'm gonna give you a story. I, I've talked about this before. I lived with a man in college who lost the use of his legs at 20 years old. He had a tumor on his spine. They screwed up on surgery and he was paralyzed for the rest of his life. He's 84 years old. When I met him, he was a high school teacher standing up at the podium on his walking sticks. We had a president who had polio standing up behind his podium on walking sticks. This same man who was a teacher, when he stopped teaching high school biology, he opened up a sailing school. He had students that who came out whom he got on boats with and taught them how to sail. After that, he taught wheelchair tennis. Not once in the 40 years that I've known this man did I ever hear him cry or complain about his fate, about his destiny, and that he was a victim of anything. He was of a religious and psychological bend where he understood that nothing could interfere with his inner world and he was in charge of his inner world regardless of his physical circumstances. So if an 84 year old man can go through his life living in a wheelchair and not crying and complaining, who who has their legs and their arms can complain and cry? Who who has clothes on their back and food to eat? My wife comes from Russia. Her parents are from the old Soviet era. That's where real repression occurred. That's where mass starvation occurred. That's where you had to grow your own food. Her parents have to continue to grow their own food today because that's what they had to do for survival. So they grow fruit, their fruits and vegetables, they process their jams and they process their juices and they pickle things and they, and they, and they keep stuff for the winter. And these people 
as soon as they got an opportunity to buy something of their own, which they didn't have when they were younger because you couldn't own anything, they ended up putting every penny into buying an apartment. And then they worked and worked and worked and saved money and bought an apartment for each of their three daughters. They didn't have time to be victims. People who are hungry don't have time to be victims. Only people who are, have wealth and a high level of foolish education have time to be victims. There's an interview, interview, uh, Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin are being interviewed uh, by um, John Anderson of Australia. Um, I think he was part of the House of Representatives from 99 to 2005. Watch it on YouTube. It's one of the, the best in-depth non-aggressive, non-violent, non-name-calling discussions about how we can become responsible for ourselves and how we are government and we, it is up to us. If we, do, if, first of all, Jordan Peterson's commentary totally in alignment with the Silverback Principle, which is take responsibility for yourself. Take 100% responsibility for yourself. He cites Alexandra, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, Gulag Archipelago, um, brilliant, brilliant uh, piece of work, uh, moved me deeply um, when I was in college, when I read it. Um, you know, about what it was like living under Stalin and being sent to, to the Gulag um, because Stalin feared his own people uh, would turn against him. And life in the Gulag was so gruesome. Well, it, 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 it re, but, but Solzhenitsyn ended up writing an, uh, a great work that sold millions and millions, in fact, tens of millions of copies. And it reminds me of, of um, Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, um, who became a eminent, renowned psychologist. And while he was in the um, Auschwitz, while he was in the, um, the concentration camps, he was helping anybody he could. But one of the things that they both came to was that their psychological state of mind was in their control. And if Viktor Frankl and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, each in different situations, can suffer through Nazi and Stalin um, gulag and, and concentration camps uh, where just the most horrific kind of treatment of human beings um, has existed. Uh, the, the, the interview that I'm, I'm referring to you sums it up and Dave Rubin sums it up very nicely and says, can any one of us, can any one of us who complain about our current situation say that our situation is far worse than our grandparents' situation. I certainly cannot. And the only those people who, you know, maybe came from Kennedy wealth or, um, you know, some kind of family fortune can talk about that. But uh, the average person can only say that our conditions today are far superior than they've been in our parents and our grandparents' generations. And 
The other thing that came up that I've that I talked to you guys a lot about is 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 the need to study, the need to read, and especially to read history and to read history of other cultures and other time periods. It gives you a perspective on your own time period. You can't know your...